moment that we accept Christ's blood as the atonement for our sins, we enter into a new covenant. We know that, but that will mark the beginning of a process, a process of transformation. Just as any covenant marks the beginning, a beginning, like marriage covenant is the beginning of the marriage. A peace covenant or a lease covenant, these are all marking the beginning of something. And they are either for a certain period uh, or indefinitely. So it subsequently <clears throat> places us under the obligation to live up to the terms of that, um, of that covenant. Now, if we speak about salvation, and then obviously right away the question comes up, do we then earn our salvation by living up to the obligation of the, the covenant? No, we don't. Um, it, begins, it begins with accepting the gift of salvation. And so that, has, that gift has already been given and received, so there is nothing changing that. Um, but now God's creative process within us can begin. And we will change into this new nature. And as a result of that, we will produce good works, good fruits, the evidence of this faith and of this uh, transformation. They are, these good works or, or fruits, are the result, the expression, the evidence. Uh, I've said this um, several times in the past uh, weeks, but it's in a very important thing to, to um, understand. Um, so it's the evidence of our relationship with God. It's the natural consequence of, um, of our faith in God. Now, we looked at this uh, indeed a few weeks ago, three weeks ago or so, um, in the message titled Sanctification. And, and I want to look at it some more. Um, because our conduct uh, resulting from this obligation is so important. And especially now in this dying world, it has become more relevant than ever. Let's see uh, what Paul writes in his letter to the Romans. This letter is directed to the church in Rome. That is uh, very clear. Uh, obviously, um, we know that from because we call it the letter to the Romans. But in uh, Romans 1 verse 7, Paul makes very clear to who it is addressed. It says there, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he, he writes to those in Rome that are called to be saints. But then in chapter 1, um, he continues to speak about, about the others, those that are not part of the church, the others. And then from verse 19 on, it's, it's very clear, you see he speaks about them, about they, about their, it's all third person. Uh, and uh, until in chapter 2, where he turns again to the saints, and he speaks about thou and thy. Um, and then in verse 10, uh, 10 yeah, of chapter 2, he writes, But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So again, here he has changed the narrative to the saints. And he speaks about the working of good. Now he does not define here what that good is, but whatever it is, uh, it has to be worked. Um, work is necessary to accomplish it. That much is clear. And then a bit further down in verse 12, he mentions the law, which in Hebrew is Torah, which means law, but it also means instruction. And now it becomes more concrete. We can actually know uh, things against which to compare our behavior, our conduct, uh, as a test of sorts, namely those instructions that have been written. It is very similar 
like when you have a, a, a any covenant. It has text in there. Usually covenants span multiple pages with, with um, definitions and clauses and uh, exclusions and all these ki kind of things, uh, often uh, some additional small print. And um, that is to define the boundaries of this, this covenant. And uh, it's important to, uh, to know these things because let's say you have uh, a lease covenant for a car, and so you lease a car and you think one day, uh, well, uh, let me uh, have a nice spoiler installed on this, um, on this car. Well, you better check uh, your covenant whether that is even allowed under this lease contract or lease covenant. So if you do not know what's in there, you might do things that violate this covenant. And it's very much the same with us uh, and the covenant that we are under after accepting the blood of Christ as um, the redemption for our sins. Now we have been directed to the law uh, from many different angles, um, even in the past messages that, uh, that I've given here. And so it must be important. The law, the Torah, the instruction or God's word. Somehow Christians don't like to refer to God's word as law. Because law implies authority. And human nature does not like authority over it. But we cannot be in a covenant and ignore or even reject the instructions that come with it. God wants us to live moral lives. He says, be holy for I am holy. And morality comes with a standard. You ask uh, people in general, uh, non-believers, uh, uh, what do you think about yourself? And most people say, I'm a good person. But then when you continue to ask according to which, which standard, then it becomes usually vague. Well, I think so. I've never done any crime or uh, never killed someone or all these kind of things you get. But you see there is not a real standard. That it's, it's uh, what they think uh, that generally is, is good. But uh, that is not so for us Christians. Uh, we have a standard. Um, and so um, we, we have to know it. And, um, then strive to live up to it. The law defines the standard and God reveals it to us. And, and we have it. We have it at our disposal. And in fact, the Holy Spirit leads us to it and through it uh, and to understand it. Uh, in John 16 verse 13, Jesus says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So, the context here, of course, is, um, is, is to love Jesus, uh, keep uh, the commandments, the law, uh, and then Jesus says, I will pray the Father and he will send you the Spirit, even the Spirit of truth. Uh, and that is, of course, to become born again. And now he expounds in this verse on what this spirit will do. And so, through that, we grow in the knowledge of the law, in the knowledge of God's ways, of God's moral standard. And we will be able to live by it. We are, in other words, transformed. But this also means that as we grow in it, as the Spirit leads us into this, that the stakes are raised, as we must live up to this increased knowledge. First, we begin as babes, we drink milk, but we grow, we mature, and we will eat meat at some point. This means that now there is a higher standard uh, revealed to us, and we should live up to that. Romans 2 verse 13, Paul uh, writes, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So, in other words, growth results in closer scrutiny against a higher standard. And um, 
or higher morality. And so that is that is more or less actually the context of uh, of this part in the, the epistle to the Romans, namely that every person is judged against what he knows, whether Jew or Gentile. And so as more is revealed to us, the stakes are raised. We are responsible for working to produce obedience at the level of what we know, at, at the level of our state of growth. And unless our faith is dead, we are growing. We should be growing. If there's no growth, really our faith is dead. And so we are normally growing and so the stakes are raising. And it's very much like children in school. Um, the children in the, in, in the higher grades are more responsible for knowing and for doing than those in the lower grades. And the examinations, the tests are adapted to that. If you would give an, uh, uh, an examination of uh, a fourth grader to a first grader, then the first grader will, he will be unable to, to make anything out of it. Um, but uh, three years later, he will be able to do it. Because there is growth, there's growth in knowledge. And therefore uh, now um, he, he's able to, um, to show the fruit of that. Or, and the justice system works the same way. Uh, adults are more responsible for their crimes than children. Because they know more. And uh, you see that for the same crime, adults are, um, will, will receive stronger um, punishment than, uh, than children. So, for us, as members of the body of Christ, the requirements, and thus the judgments, are much stricter because we know more. And it's really something to think about, because many times, I uh, notice, we, we go into this mode that uh, once we've, we've reached some level, whatever it may be, uh, we stay there. We, we are okay, we feel fine, we think we, that's, that's it. Um, but it's not so. Um, Paul writes to uh, the Romans again in uh, chapter 3, in verse 31, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yeah, we establish the law. So faith establishes the law, or upholds it, because the law points out how faith is to be lived out. So certainly... Uh, the, the law does not disappear because of our faith. So this brings us back to obligation. We have a moral obligation to Christ under the new covenant. You can call it maybe a duty. And this is naturally produced by a strong feeling of indebtedness. It's not, it's not we... Um, we have an obligation because we have to and we don't really want to, but we have to know it's, it's uh, um, an obligation because you want to. Uh, it's, it's like something that uh, one owes in return of a favor. It's not a payback because, well, we can never pay back for the gift of salvation to begin with, not by far. But uh, even in, in, um, on, a, on a human level, if someone does you a favor, the favor is done. You can say thank you very much uh, and, and that's it. Um, but still you can have this feeling of you are obliged to do something in return. Not because you have to, but because you want to. Because the, pe the other person was so good to do you this favor. Um, this, this is this, this deeply held personal loyalty, this faithfulness that is produced. And um, this is certainly so in the case of salvation. If this does not create in us this feeling of uh, loyalty, of faithfulness, um, then we have really not understood the greatness of this gift. Uh, there is uh, this, uh, this uh, story, uh, well, it's allegedly a true story, um, which played in uh, South America um, well, about a few hundred years ago, when slave trade was uh, still a normal thing. Um, 
There was a slave market and um, one of the landowners came to this market and um, there was this, uh, this uh, black woman for, uh, for sale as a slave. And so um, he uh, made a high bid and he, he bought her. So what happens is that, um, as was normal, you would get a certificate of ownership and um, you could take the slave home. And so as uh, this landowner and this, uh, this woman that he now bought were walking back to the, uh, to the estate, uh, the woman was so, so angry with him for buying, him and treat, uh, buying her and treating her as, as if she was uh, an object or an animal, and she spit in his face. And um, the, uh, the owner looked back at her and uh, shook his head and said, uh, you do not understand what I've done. And he took the certificate of ownership out of his pocket and he said, this is for you. I didn't buy you to own you, I, buy, I bought you so that I could set you free. And at that moment, uh, the woman uh, began to realize what had happened and um, she stayed with him for the rest of her life and served him uh, not as a, as a, a slave uh, in bondage but um, as a loyal um, servant. This story very much reflects how our attitude should be towards Jesus. Um, this loyalty shifts our attention focus from, uh, from self to Jesus and thus from self-satisfaction to faithfulness and this is very important because self-satisfaction uh, is driving is the driving force behind sin uh, and of course Satan and his uh, minions they will fuel this and so there is this this Debt, if you will, this obligation that is created because of this massive gift that is being given. Now sin also indebts us. And the wages of sin is death, as Romans 6.23 says. So once we sin, we are in debt to the one we obeyed in sinning. Um, and at that moment we are living on borrowed time. It's, uh, Paul writes to the Ephesians, Ephesians 2 verse 1, uh, uh, In your uh, um, sins and trespasses you are dead. So basically when we sin we are dead. It's not been uh, executed yet, but we basically are already at that moment. And, um, and th therefore we live on borrowed time. Which is mercy, because that borrowed time gives us uh, the chance to get out of the situation. But we live on borrowed time, and so we become the borrowers, the debtors, and we lose our independence. We, we now owe our lives to someone else, and this someone else uh, is, of course, Satan, the most cruel taskmaster master in the universe. And the only way out is by supernatural means. Hebrews 2 verse 14 and 15 make this very clear. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So this tells us that it is only Jesus who can deliver us, who can release us from this bondage to Satan. It's only Jesus. How does he do that? By annulling the debt. Or in other words, by buying us back. It's just like this uh, example I just gave where this, this landowner bought the slave. By the way, read Hosea, same story there. That buying back is called to redeem. Yeah, that's the word for it. It's a legal term. It's also a, a term used in the, in the financial banking world to redeem, to buy back. And now you uh, gain ownership. 
and, and the, the former ownership is now uh, ended. And this is what Jesus has done. And he has done so with the high price of his blood. And it's um, beautifully put into words by Peter in 1 Peter 1, verses 17 through 19. And he writes there, And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judged according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation you received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That should demand our commitment, our loyalty, our obligation to Christ. It was not just a high price that he paid, it was the highest possible price, the highest possible in the entire universe. Um, God the Father was willing to give up that which was most precious to him. And this was perfectly foreshadowed in the story of Abram and Isaac. Abram was willing to give up Isaac, his only begotten son, the one through which God had promised that um, there would be, uh, he would be the father of nations. Now, at the same time, Jesus willingly volunteered to be the payment in full. And this is really something you have to ponder on and think through. It is, is a massive, massive sacrifice. And, and uh, it, it becomes maybe even more sobering if you think that he would have done the same if you were the only person in the universe. He would still have done it for you. Uh, that is how great his love is. And um, it's really, uh, yeah, if that does not create a feeling of loyalty, of faithfulness, this obligation in you, then, then you haven't grasped it, uh, I suppose. Um, some years ago I recorded this song, uh, Will You Go? And uh, I will leave the link uh, here, where you see sort of this conversation between the father and the son uh, before Jesus goes to the, to the earth to, um, to bring this sacrifice, to fulfill this, uh, this mission. And, um, it's, a, it's an interesting perspective to also look at it. Jesus, I want you to go to words and give your life for the sin. Will you go? Will you go? And so, we are at the receiving end of this redemption. And how do we feel? That's the question. Do we feel spiritual obligation? Uh, do we respond like this slave woman did uh, in, in the aforementioned example? It should be our natural response. And Paul reminds us of this uh, through um, his epistle to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20, he says, For you are bought with a price, and therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are gods. He clearly states here who has ownership and that this uh, came with a high price and that therefore we have the moral obligation to glorify him. Yes, Christ has paid our debt to sin and he has set us free. But it does put us under obligation to give our lives to him in obedience. And if the feeling is, oh, I don't want to, but I have to, then we haven't understood anything. The feeling should be, I want to, because he saved me. I want to end with Romans 6, verses 20 to 23, where it says, For when ye were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants of God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, 
but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen.